Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you so much for being with us today for this virtual launch of the IFPRI's 2022 Global Food Policy Report on Climate Change and Food Systems. Thank you also to those of you who will be watching this event recording after the event. We're very keen to hear from you throughout this event. Um, please submit your brief questions on ifpri.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpri on Twitter. Uh, we'll be looking forward to the Q&A session and hearing from as many of you as we can. It's now my great pleasure to uh, turn the floor over to Jo Swinnen, who serves as the Global Director of the Systems Transformation Science Group within the CGIR, and who also serves as the Director General of IFPRI. Together with Channing Arndt, the Director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at IFPRI, they will be presenting an overview of this year's Global Food Policy Report. Over to you, Yo and Channing. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor for me to introduce uh, the report. Every year it's a very special event for, uh, for IFPRI. And this year particularly, it's, it's, a, it's a special event for even more reasons. One, it's the, uh, as you know, the CGIR is in uh, part uh, in the process of going, undergoing a serious transition uh, to it. And so one of it is that we are working closely with our colleagues from me and from uh, the Alliance of Biodiversity and then see out on, uh, on a number of issues, on a number of the new research portfolio and then a very important component of that is climate change. And I'm pleased that our colleagues are here with us today as well. Um, the, um, this is obviously an issue and I do not need to uh, introduce the, the relevance and the importance of, of, of this topic. Uh, can I have the first slide please? The relation between climate change and food systems is, is in two directions. On the one hand, climate change is posing a growing threat to sustainable uh, food systems. We know that since uh, essentially and since the middle of next of last decade, I mean, the global food and nutrition security in the world is seriously worsening. It was already worsening before COVID-19 and COVID-19 has reinforced the, the problems that we see around the world. I mean, particularly with income losses and with job losses, we've seen a very strong rise in, in malnutrition around the world. Also disruption of supply chains played a role there. We've seen rising conflicts around the world. They have played a, a very important role over the last uh, uh, decade really. And in uh, recent years, the situation is also there worsening. We just had the launch last week of the global report of food crisis, which came up with numbers which show that this is also going in the in the bad direction. And of course, as you all know, the current war in Ukraine is, is basically contributing to a further worsening of the situation. Now, in addition to the, the food and nutrition security, the sustainability of our food systems in, in the medium and long run is really threatened by environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change is a very important component, or actually of all these factors, because it, of course, also plays a role in, in rising conflicts. For example, climate change affects the food system in a number of ways, and it affects it through uh, different mechanisms, as we will hear a lot about today. I don't have to go in, in detail here. Next slide, please. At the same time, uh, there's also the other direction, which is that our food systems are contributing to climate change. Our food systems, our estimates are around one third of total uh, greenhouse emissions and about that are coming from food systems and about uh, one fifth of the total emissions come from what's called uh, AFOLU, agriculture, forestry and, and other land use and the rest from the, the rest of the food system. And of course, this distribution differs uh, along, um, I mean, it's different in rich countries and in poor countries, for example. What we see, though, which is worrisome, is that developing countries, which we know are going to hit, be hit um, particularly badly by climate change, are themselves a growing source of, of emissions okay, in, the, in the food systems. The good side of the coin, if you want, is that because it's such a significant impact, that means if we can change it, it can also have serious potential, really large potential, of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and therefore of affecting climate change in, in a better direction. Next slide, please. The, uh, the time is right, uh, certainly for a report like this. We had three major summits last year. I'm sure you all remember the United Nations Food Systems Summit, 
COP26 in Glasgow, and there was also the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit. And in all these three summits, climate change, the link between climate change and the food system was, was made very explicitly. We also heard that the, um, the next COPs, COP27, COP28 also going forward even, are likely to put a bigger emphasis on food systems than they have in the past. And we think this is really needed. So it's, it's a good thing that this gets a bigger uh, part on, on, on the global agenda. And clearly there's a number of other uh, important international conferences that come up. And we know that there are the transition pathways which follow up on the United Nations Food Systems Summit at the national level, which really need to take this really at the core of, the, uh, of their strategy. Next slide, please. You should not be surprised that our uh, report, this is uh, from the International Food Policy Research Institute, it focuses very strongly on policies. Policies are a crucial component and so this is a quote from the IPCC report. So appropriate design of policies, institutions, and governance systems can contribute to land-related adaptation mitigation while facilitating the pursuit of climate adaptive development pathways. And so what we'll hear today is a number of the policy uh, proposals that will come out of the report about the evidence that's being presented here, research that led to this evidence on a number of different areas. Next slide, please. And so what is here is just, it's the list of the chapters. So this is, a, if you want the thematic chapters, there's also a set of regional chapters. And so we will hear from very, from several uh, of the authors of the different chapters today. And you see it's a wide range of things related to changing agricultural subsidies and the incentives with that trade, research, finance, social protection, governance, nutrition, etc. Okay, and so I really look forward to, to the detailed presentations on this, and I'm now passing the floor to Channing, who will give a, a summary of some of the, the key findings. Over to you, Channing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yo. So let's move on to the next slide, please. As Yo, as Yo mentioned, we're looking at climate change, and we've had about a degree of uh, uh, temperature rise since pre-industrial time, and we expect at least another half a degree over the next 30 years or so, and, and perhaps more in the future. Um, and this is a bit sobering given the, the fact that we're feeling it quite a lot already, and we're gonna get you know, a half degree more uh, over a relatively short period of time. And this really means that adaptation is urgent. It's, it's an imperative, the, the systems are, are changing. Um, and there are possibilities. These are the, um, the, the, the focus of much of the chapters uh, is how to adapt. And uh, I'll, I'll let people get into that uh, series of promising innovations that can be uh, applied. But certainly adaptation is possible, but it's not unlimited. So eventually we want a stabilized climate and we want it uh, soon. Uh, so that's the next step. Next slide, please. Which is, which is mitigation. On the right-hand side, um, we see the, the global emissions shares from AFOLU. This excludes fossil fuel emissions. If you put in fossil fuel emissions related to the food system, the production and marketing and so forth, comes out to more than a third. Agriculture, forestry, and other land use, or AFOLU, is around um, 21%. And if we're going to get to a stable global climate, these are too large to ignore. Many of them, as Yo pointed out, come from uh, developing countries. So there's, there's a long way to run in terms of going from 21% uh, uh, or 33%, depending on how you, you count it, whether fossil fuel is in or not, uh, to zero. But uh, it actually looks like you'll have to go farther than that. The goal of COP26 is net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, that was the target set in Glasgow. Uh, and we don't believe, the reason net is used is that we don't believe that all sectors will go to zero by 2050 that some, uh, there will be some residual emissions at that time, which means some sectors need to go negative. And the agriculture, forest and other land use sector is right now the only efficient means for getting uh, greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. And so uh, unless technology changes, uh, the global food sector uh, will have to become not just uh, zero emissions, but a, a net sink. Uh, in order to offset. So these, these are the big challenges that we're looking at uh, over the next 30 years. Next slide, please. So here from the report are a few policy recommendations. We're going to have uh, presentations that go into some of these in, in more detail. So I will, I will touch on them only, only lightly. One relates to research and development in production practices and elsewhere. 
Uh, there are a number of promising innovations out there for drought tolerance, heat tolerance, uh, disease tolerance, and so forth. Uh, and, and these are important. Um, they relate very much to the second uh, bullet recommendation, which is holistic governments of water, land, and, and ecosystems, as well as forests. And this relates to the notion of agriculture as fitting more holistically and, and a more nature positive sense into ecosystems uh, and the environment. Uh, and this involves governance because uh, what one farm or what one actor is doing spills over uh, to the other. And these, these are two uh, sets of very interesting chapters on how to deal with you moving in a, appropriate innovation through the system, as well as uh, this broader governance perspective. And both of these relate to both adaptation and mitigation. Next slide, please. Climate change is a long run phenomenon. We are looking at uh, a much warmer and more volatile world by, by 2050. Um, so the child on the right that you're looking at will be will be uh, experiencing needing to adapt, needing to to adjust to uncertain circumstances, and we want that child to have um, as much human capital, as much capability as possible. And healthy diets are are an extremely important part of that. So if we're going to have children growing up and being able to confront climate change in the 2030s, 2040s, and 2050s, getting them to eat healthy diets today is, is really a crucial element of our adaptation uh, response. And there is a chapter that puts forward a number of nudges or other elements to get them to try to uh, move people towards uh, healthier diets. Um, we have also, and this will be discussed, uh, uh, efforts to improve the efficiency of value chains, facilitate trade and reduce food loss. Um, a, a, a big one is as we're expecting a more volatile world all around, uh, global trade will become more important in order to offset in a fair trade way and in a manner that uh, is, is consistent with uh, mitigation objectives, but uh, as an important element uh, to a more stable and resilient um, global food system. Next slide, please. Social protection is going to be covered. Um, climate change, we're quite certain we're going to get warmer and we're quite certain that we're going to have more precipitation globally, but where that precipitation will be exactly, uh, its timing and so forth uh, is quite uncertain. Uh, and, and we expect you know, a, a, a higher incidence of extreme events. And we, there's a wonder whether private insurance and other mechanisms will be able to keep up even for those who can afford it. For those who cannot, they will be uh, uh, exposed. Social protection is an important mechanism for providing some uh, safety net uh, to people to counter this, this much more uncertain and volatile uh, environment. And we'll look forward to hearing about that. We're also going to hear about a reorientation of financial flows. Um, this is both repurposing of agricultural subsidies, which is a very large expenditure, which may be more usefully spent at least a portion of it towards research and development on green innovations. Um, we'll also hear about novel, uh, more novel uh, changes to the way that we do business in terms of moving money to support adaptation and mitigation. Uh, this is important, um, particularly take the mitigation side. We need a, uh, an efficient and effective means for uh, converting uh, 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 people who would like to offset emissions into effective emissions offsets that also contribute to broader development objectives. So um, move to the next slide, please. These are our authors. Uh, we get to hear from a few of them. I won't uh, mention any more and I will pass it back to Charlotte. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yo and Channing for the overview of the GFPR this year. We're now moving into a series of rapid fire presentations covering just four of the report's 12 chapters. Um, and today we're focusing in particular on climate finance, connected to that repurposing agricultural support, international trade and social protection. These thematic rapid fires will then be followed by three of the six regional chapters. As you saw, this is a very rich report, lots of chapters. So we do encourage um, our audience to take a look also at the chapters that we are not able to cover today. So now it's my pleasure to kick off the rapid fire session. Uh, our first speaker is Eugenio Diaz Bonilla, who is an AICA visiting fellow here at IFPRI. 
And Eugenio has done a lot of research on funding sustainable food systems transformation and will talk to us today about the need for uh, doing more uh, with regard to climate finance. Over to you, Eugenio. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Good day, everybody. We wrote the chapter with Ruben Echeverria, a senior advisor to the Gates Foundation. Uh, the, 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 as, as Joe uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, food systems and climate change, they have a two way. Food systems are affected, uh, affect more, much more than climate change and climate change affected by far more than, um, than food systems. So the, the, if we are talking about finance, then the question, given that intersection, what are the costs? And you have a variety of estimates. Uh, we, we do a quick review and certainly because the scope, the objectives, the assumptions and the models are different, that's why you have so many uh, different estimates. Um, then if we go to the next question, which is what does it mean financing? And we take, a, we took a, a different, the, the broad view of financing, more in line with the Paris Agreement objectives, Article 2, Paragraph 1C, that talks about making finance flows um, consistent with pathways towards low, low greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this also the approach that the Standing Committee on Finance uh, took, which basically looks at, at a variety of, of flows. And so we simplified or uh, give a framework for those flows, talking about six flows, the consumer expenditure, eight to $10 trillion, which are the income um, or the cash flow for all the operators on food value chains, from small farmers in Kenya and Honduras to Walmart and McDonald's, etc. So those are the two internal flows. And then we have four external flows, the international development funds, multilateral, bilateral, philanthropic, public budget, uh, banking system and capital markets. So the next question, given that framework is what, what are the size of these flows and the types? Are they climate positive, climate neutral, climate negative? And what is the financing gap? We, we discussed a little bit of that in the, in the chapter. And then what can be done? Can we um, scale up the climate positive, eliminate uh, the climate negative and, and repurpose the money that is in the climate negative uh, expenditure right now? And perhaps there may be the need of reallocate some of the neutral funds, um, uh, flow of funds. So we, I move to the what can be done and then how. <clears throat> what can be done? Uh, if we look first, we need to have a, a, an overall incentive framework and Joe Glover and other, um, was also mentioned by by Channing and, and Joe Sweenen, uh, basically a macroeconomic and trade framework, but then an effective incentive framework for climate change. So that's legislating net zero carbon target, pricing climate externalities, developing of carbon markets, a disclosure of climate risks. Then we, you can go different um, interventions at each one of the levels of the flows. Uh, how do you guide consumption and production decisions? The governments have taxes, subsidies, uh, regulations, for instance, on food, uh, waste and losses on deforestation, information requirements, public investments. Uh, if we go to the international development funds, this is the smallest of all the flows. So therefore they need to be used strategically, guaranteeing, blend, uh, guaranteeing flows for the private sector to jump in, uh, bl blend, uh, blended, blended finance and so on. Better use, for instance, of this uh, special drawing rights of the IMF that now are being used with a uh, very little multiplier. We suggested some ways of having a bigger multiplier effect. And some of the international development flows, they are still not financing climate negative activities. So they need to be eliminated and repurposed. If we go to national public budgets, uh, uh, Channing mentioned the repurposing of agriculture, but we, you need also a public expenditure and tax review with a food system uh, focus, which is not happening yet. Uh, so there are fossil fuel subsidies, the, how, how you can uh, improve the safety nets that uh, Dan will talk later, and particularly the generation of uh, public goods uh, on uh, uh, research, development and innovation. Regarding the, the banking system and capital markets, of course, having the right incentive framework that I mentioned at the beginning is the starting point. It's very important, but then there may be some individual interventions like facilities, project preparation facilities to develop in a, a pipeline on event, investable opportunities, trade lines that are targeted to climate positive activities and disadvantaged groups, and then the role of public banks. In the past, they were eliminated, but now they are, they are a very important source of funds, eliminated in several countries, in developing countries in Africa and Latin America, but they are an important source of funds 
So therefore, the, uh, we need to make sure that they work to address uh, market failures. So what uh, then, how can all this be done? We have basically two instruments, coalitions and national plans. Coalitions, there are several coalitions on, on finance, public, uh, public banks alliance, good food finance, but there are other coalitions. The main point uh, to consider in, my, in, in our view was where um, the, the structure, do they have a secretary, do they have financing? And in many cases, the, some of these coalitions overlap, they have the same topic, they need to be uh, sort of consolidated or harmonized. Then the other is the national plans. Basically, they, they have to be not only climate positive, they have to be aligned with the sustainable development goals. The, the main thing is that you have like two tracks at the UN level. You have the UN Food System Summit with national pathways, and you have the UN Primo Convention for Climate Change that basically look at national determined contribution, national adaptation plans. Uh, these two have institutional framework processes and so on. How, how you articulate both and they, that has to happen mostly at the country level. So countries need to establish uh, a coordinating mechanism uh, to ensure the national pathways, the NDCs and NAPs are uh, integrated and the IICA, IFPRI, so all of us are trying to help some of the countries on that regard. Um, and then all the rest of the bilateral international organizations should be uh, work within those country-based uh, plans. So those are the main messages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kenyo, for that overview of the six flows of uh, existing flows of finance and your thoughts about how we can do a better job in making sure those all support climate change adaptation and, and mitigation more than they do today. And you've really nicely set the scene for our next rapid fire, which is going to be uh, given by Rob Voss, who's the director of the market trade uh, a division at um, at IFPRI, and Rob is speaking to us today about that important part of the uh, the public budget, which goes to um, agricultural support. Um, thank you, Charlotte. The persistent challenges of global food security and the existential threat of climate change raises these questions about the suitability of the existing agricultural policies and the incentives they create to address the challenges of today's and tomorrow's food system. So this question was also put prominently on the table for the UN Food System Summit, COP26 and other fora. So the outstanding question chapter two of the uh, Global Food Policy Report addresses is how the massive public support of more than $600 billion per year currently provided to agriculture could be repurposed to deliver better outcomes for the health of people and the planet. Next slide, please. So what is this 600 plus dollar question? Um, the positive support to agriculture averaged uh, 638 billion dollars per year in 2016, 2018, and it's hovered around that number <coughs> subsequently. The level of support varies widely across countries in absolute terms. Most of the support goes to farmers in China, the European Union and the United States. And more than 70% is linked to farm production and input use, influencing market prices and production decisions. This type of support is generally considered to be harmful because it distorts markets and is bad for the environment. It also is remarkably inefficient in supporting farm incomes and production, as on that account, the return is only 35 cents per dollar spent. Only 17% of the current support is for public goods and services supporting agriculture, such as research and development and rural infrastructure, and just one tenth takes the form of subsidies for consumers. At a time when farmers bear the brunt of worsening climate change, volatile markets, and shifting consumer demands, government support to farmers is very much needed, but it will have to be done differently. So chapter two of the report assesses the options for repurposing to better support farmers, such that collectively they can contribute to, the, to solve societal problems of food insecurity and malnutrition, poverty, climate change, and the unsustainable patterns of food production and consumption. The next slide, please. So based on our scenario analysis using uh, IFPRI's global model, uh, Miragro DAP, we find that despite being harmful, the simple removal of all current support will not produce the game-changing reductions in emissions needed for sustainability and neither for food security or poverty reduction. 
and farmers will not like it as their incomes will be hurt. In contrast, if a good part of the existing support would be repurposed for investing in research and development for green innovations that are both emission reducing and importantly, production productivity enhancing and for providing incentives to farmers and other value chain actors to adopt those innovations, if we do all that, there can be substantial win-win-win gains in terms of emission reductions, food security, uh, poverty reduction, making health, uh, healthy diets more affordable, and um, also improvements for nature. This beneficial scenario is, just not, is not just pie in the sky, but it builds on evidence about new technologies that have shown enormous potential to both reduce emissions and raise agricultural productivity. The next slide, please. So these findings make a very strong case for action and more to the point for internationally concerted action. So if these are such good ideas, why is the repurposing not happening? The chapter devotes quite a bit of space to the political hurdles to agricultural and food policy reform. Learning from past reforms, overcoming fierce national resistance from affected stakeholders can be a huge challenge. And such resistance is guaranteed if the short and long-term social and private costs and benefits of the reforms are not clear to the stakeholders. Hence, a proper understanding of those costs and benefits and how they will be distributed should be a starting point for earning political support for any type of reform. Engaging in multi-stakeholder dialogues should be next to underpin food system-wide support for the repurposing agenda. Successful reforms have shown that investing more in R&D encounters less resistance, and hence the core proposal made in this chapter could well win over much support. Also leveraging national, national commitments to multiple agreements has proven successful in major recent reforms to agriculture policies. Hence, while reform is always hard, we may be optimistic that the change is possible. Moreover, <clears throat> by repurposing the present support in the sense uh, I indicated, market incentives will be shifted. And this should also help crowd in private finance and investments for the sustainable transformation of food systems. So the 600 plus billion dollar question might well find a multi-trillion dollar answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for laying out the very clear logic for repurposing and also addressing some of the political hurdles. IFPRI has done a lot of work on this topic. And likewise, IFPRI is very engaged on the, on the trade topics. It's now my pleasure to turn to Joe Glauber, who serves as a senior research fellow at IFPRI, who will speak to us today about the role of trade and climate change and whether further reforms might be required in international trade disciplines. Great. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Um, yeah, so as Charlotte said, uh, the chapter three can, um, looks at trade and the role that it uh, might play in addressing some of the challenges of climate change. Uh, next slide. So climate change is uh, projected to cause significant regional shifts in agricultural production, uh, potentially reducing productivity, increasing variability of crop uh, and livestock production. We have a lot of evidence, uh, a lot of it done at IFPRI uh, that, that shows those shifts and uh, what we might expect in, in the coming years. But what that means is that uh, that's going to put uh, severe pressures on feeding the world. Trade allows countries to obtain nutritious food at the lowest possible cost. And so it will be a key component in any strategy to help countries feed and nourish their populations. And what uh, the, the literature suggests is that trade can also promote more efficient uses of natural resources and potentially reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, I think as we look forward, there's a lot of tensions that have uh, starting to emerge between global trading rules and national interests. For example, we, we see uh, movements in Canada and the US and others in the EU uh, to, to think about how to address climate change through things like border measures, uh, like carbon, but, uh, carbon border adjustment measures, um, new trading rules to, uh, that would uh, establish standards, policies that uh, are uh, 
domestic support policies that are set up to address um, climate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think here the, the question is, well, how can trade policies support food system transfer, uh, transformation objectives and how can policies to support the food system transformation objectives be designed to be WTO compatible? Next slide. So if we look at just the growth of trade over the last uh, 20 years, it's been phenomenal. Uh, trade in agricultural products has more than tripled since uh, to the mid 2000s and uh, more than doubled in volume. And, and even during COVID where we saw uh, uh, manufacturing trade fall off, agricultural trade actually grew during that period. The other big uh, move that we've seen is that uh, over the last uh, 20 some odd years, 25 years, uh, we've seen a growing uh, importance of developing country trade, both South-South trade, but also uh, just in terms of the share of trade that, that uh, occupied by developing countries in terms of exports and imports, now accounting for over 40% of trade. Again, dramatic growth and with, with uh, 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 big shifts in, in regions. I, 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 I like to, uh, during this current crisis in Ukraine, it's, it's amazing to think that that region was a net importer of food in just 20 years ago. And now, of course, it's, it's, it's a breadbasket of the world in the current crisis um, uh, causing problems along those lines. Next slide. So the, some of the conflicts that we've seen, again, countries putting in place rules that, that uh, would impose costs on their producers in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions or, or other sorts of things, uh, sustainability standards, um, and to prevent leakage, that is importation of commodities that were uh, 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 produced at a lower cost because they did not have these uh, same sorts of regulations on greenhouse gases and other sorts of things. The idea that border measures would be established uh, to prevent that leakage. The issues uh, uh, there, in particular, things WTO issues uh, uh, on national treatment. That is, you're supposed to do anything you do for foreign uh, suppliers. You should be uh, uh, doing no worse than what you're doing with your own uh, farmers, and that they shouldn't be discriminatory between nations. So these are challenges. Subsidies to improve, improve uh, to promote improved outcomes, uh, like what Rob was just talking about, repurposing. The issue there is if they're tied to production or input usage, they could be distorting and end up causing uh, uh, distorting trade and production that could potentially harm other uh, suppliers in the world. And then the whole issue of standards uh, there a need to come up with a, a recognized and accepted standards like we have for sanitary and phytosanitary uh, issues. Next slide. So I think that, that it's a very simple message in the sense of, of promoting climate policies that facilitate not impede trade because trade will be very, very important and increasingly important uh, with climate change. I think there the, the, we're back to the same old issues that we're always talking about with trade liberalization, that is the need to reduce tariff and non-tariff barriers. But I think more importantly now, we're, it's important to ensure that standards are applied equitably and are science-based and not just disguised protectionism. Um, harmful subsidies, uh, we should reduce and repurpose those as Rob mentioned, but we should encourage climate smart policies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions but do not distort production. And that's true with mitigation policies as well. And with that, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, for highlighting the need for climate smart trade policies that are in line with WTO, existing WTO disciplines, but also pointing to the areas where perhaps greater clarity will be required uh, in the WTO framework. Um, last but not least in our uh, series of rapid fire uh, presentation is a presentation by Dan Gilligan. He's the Deputy Director of IFPRI's Poverty, Health and Nutrition Division. And he's speaking to, to us today about another very important topic, namely social protection, designing adaptive systems to build resilience to climate change. 
Thank you, Charlotte, and hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so chapter six of the Global Food Policy Report um, addresses the role that social protection can play, and it's a vital one in terms of helping to promote uh, resilience to climate change and manage national strategies to adapt. Next slide, please. So the, the central question that we address in this chapter is why, um, why is social protection needed for climate change responses? Uh, and there's a very good case to be made here. So first is social protection programs are, are central to national strategies to increase incomes for the poor and protect them from livelihood shocks. So by social protection programs, I'm referring to targeted cash transfers and food transfers, uh, food vouchers, school meals, public works, um, and other public forms of insurance. These, uh, these strategies are used as the central uh, uh, approach for, for national governments to address poverty in their countries um, and also to help households or households adapt to, to shocks. Um, these programs are widely used. They now reach more than 2 billion people globally. Because we expect climate change in part to lead to substantial income shocks for the rural and urban poor, that means that central protection, uh, social protection has a really uh, central role to play. Uh, luckily, we have a lot of evidence on the effectiveness of these programs. So uh, the positive impacts of social protection are really well documented in published research. Uh, we see that there are broad effects of these programs on food security and assets for the poor um, and actually reducing poverty and promoting increased savings and encouraging education and keeping children in school. There is evidence that these programs are also effective uh, against shocks and to promote resilience. Although that evidence for climate shocks in particular and climate stressors is not as well developed, uh, that's an area of research where IFPRI is investing a lot at the moment. Uh, next, I want to emphasize two components of social protection programs that are really important to uh, climate change response. So first is that social protection programs can be a platform for the national strategies to address climate change by integrating with other climate related policies. So these show up in many ways in what are called cash plus approaches. So you can twin cash transfers targeted to poor households with other strategies, for example, to promote crop diversification for climate resilient crops, to encourage soil and water management practices, or to help uh, smooth transitions, for example, to off farm employment as labor uh, moves off or away from agriculture gradually. Next, I want to emphasize that social protection is really critical to make climate change responses more inclusive. So first, this is clear because social protection programs are targeted to the poor. So you get uh, socioeconomic inclusion through that. But also lots of evidence shows that women are disproportionately affected by climate change. And this is due to the fact that they have less access to land, less control over resources at the household level, less voices in their community. This makes them more vulnerable to climate type risks. Uh, but the good news for social protection is that these programs are already prioritized um, in the form of social assistance to be targeted to women. That's that's the, the most common approach at the moment is that women are usually selected as the, as the primary beneficiary of these programs. Uh, but beyond that, social protection programs are actually not particularly gender sensitive. So we're encouraging in the, in the chapter making programs more gender sensitive and that will also make them more inclusive for promoting climate change response. Next slide, please. Here, I just wanna talk about some potential approaches for social protection to address climate change. We do have some evidence here um, that's quite compelling and suggesting a way forward. So first is, a, um, I'll point to some evidence along the lines of improving climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, some IFRI research has shown that cash transfers combined with uh, agricultural input packages and agricultural extension in Malawi was very effective at promoting uh, productivity improvements. Similar approaches could be adapted for promoting adoption of climate change resilient crops. Um, similarly, public works in Ethiopia were very effective uh, at increasing tree cover by 4%. Um, also applying innovative approaches for risk management is going to be central. So things like state contingent cash transfers that come in online um, in the case of a climate shock or index-based livestock insurance will be important. Also incentivizing employment transitions and supporting geogra geographic relocation can be important. There is not a lot of work done in this in the moment where cash transfers are, are actually used to incentivize those employment transitions. 
but I want to highlight a program called Forza in Egypt that is actually uh, using this approach to provide you the targeted asset transfers or job training to help smooth transitions. Next slide, please. So last, I just want to cover uh, five steps that governments can take now to help improve the way that social protection is used to mitigate the climate risks. The first is to expand coverage of social assistance program to improve resilience. This is what was done and very effectively during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this can be done here as well. There is a concern about cost. On average, social protection contributes about 1.5% of GDP. Um, so those costs need to be considered. But similarly, you have to consider the fact that um, in the absence of, of, of social protection transfers that many poor households facing significant poverty traps. Next is to reform social protection systems to be more adaptive. This means that in the face of a shock that uh, government should consider both vertical expansion, meaning more transfers going to current beneficiaries, horizontal expansions where there are covariate shocks to and bring other households into the programs, and then also piggybacking other initiatives uh, on top of social protection. Next is to undertake uh, risk and challenge assessments these are really vital, and those have to include climate change forecasting, uh, worsening climate risks, uh, and should also include development of action plans. Next is to reform program modalities to support household coping strategies. And, and so this includes, our, our main recommendation here is to replace wherever possible in-person cash and food transfers with delivery of uh, transfers through digital means such as through mobile money. And then the last is to make social protection programs more climate smart through things like weather index insurance schemes and environmentally friendly public works. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dan. You've really highlighted, of course, the importance of social protection and now the challenge of making that more climate smart. And it's really fantastic to see some of that research underway. Let me remind all of you, um, if you're tuning in live, that you can submit your brief questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. We'll be coming very soon to the Q&A session. We're now moving into uh, three additional rapid fires, but these will be looking at particular regions. There are actually six regional chapters in the GFPR this year. Today, we're covering three of them, Middle East and North Africa. Oh, sorry, uh, those are the ones we're not covering. Uh, we're starting with South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Our first uh, regional rapid fire is being presented by Aditi Mukherjee, who is a principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute and has also been closely involved in this last IPCC report. Aditi, over to you to discuss the challenges in South Asia. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, this chapter was co-written with two colleagues from IFPRI. Um, South Asia is, as most of us know, a climate change hotspot, not only because of the exposure to hazard, it's, its location in the tropical region where warming affects more than any other region, but also because of high amount of existing vulnerabilities in terms of poverty and, and a whole host of other reasons. So some of the main uh, findings from this chapter, which is also obviously corroborated by the IPCC work, is that in this region, uh, already historically mean and extreme temperatures have risen and are projected to rise further. But the average temperature rise has been a little less than the global average temperature rise of 1.1 degrees. Here, it's more like 0 .7, 0 0.7 degrees since uh, from the beginning of the last century. And the reason is uh, partly the cooling effect of the aerosol, which, which also is basically the pollution. Um, the other big one is around Himalayan glaciers. They are melting at unprecedented rates. They are melting faster than any time in the history since glacial monitoring began, and that was 100, 120 years ago. Uh, there has been increase in monsoon rainfall has been uh, also observed since the 1950s, but the cooling effect again of aerosols has kept it somewhat muted than the global average. And we are also finding that water related hazards are projected to increase and South Asia region uh, doesn't have a lot of studies that puts right now climate science allows us to provide climate change fingerprint of individual extreme uh, weather event. And in South Asia, we do not have a lot of those studies. One exception being the 2017 floods in Bangladesh, where it was clear that climate change had made those heavy rainfalls more likely than otherwise. 
um, just an image that I am particularly fond of around the glacier mill. This is the northern side of the of the Mount Everest. Uh, I think it's a photograph taken in 1921, and this is how it looks now in in 2018. I think the next photograph is, and this is this is kind of true of Himalayas, but also true of the Andes and pretty much all the mountains. Glaciers are melting very fast. So, what does it mean for the region's um, overall agri food systems? A couple of main things we are finding. First is a declining rate of growth of yields. Basically, technology-induced increases in total factor productivity that we had seen in South Asia, the green revolution that we had seen. What we are seeing is declining rate of growth of yields in pretty much all the agricultural subsectors, uh, be it uh, the crop sector or, or fisheries or any of these. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I mean, act also attributable to climate change, obviously. The second major trend in the region is partly policy-induced groundwater depletion. Here, the climate change impact is not as clear, but what is clear is that the future impact of climate change and groundwater recharge is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is partly uncertain, but climate change will also impact the already crisis situation of groundwater. Um, uh, we are also finding that existing vulnerabilities to food and nutrition security will become more serious. Uh, and it is almost uh, with high confidence we can say that COVID-19 along with climate change has actually meant that the SDG goal of zero hunger is most likely not to be, will not be met in the region. And that is, it's, it's also one of the most uh, yeah, vulnerable in terms of all of those. Uh, then again, negative impacts on water security is projected. We already know that South Asia has a huge water crisis. And uh, some of these uh, future projections says that of the world's five basins where water scarcity led GDP losses are projected, at least three of them are in South Asia. Um, now coming to adaptation and mitigation actions, we touch upon this um, uh, in this, um, uh, in this uh, report. Um, so uh, we have divided in this in this chapter into two main parts around technologies and crop diversification and our main and this is a figure that I have taken from the IPCC chapter that I led on water here the main takeaway is that and this is not South Asia specific but a lot of the studies here are from South Asia which is actually showing and for me one of the biggest takeaway has been that adaptation as I think the first speaker said that adaptation will not take us completely all the way that we want to because adaptation will inherently become less effective with more warming so if you see the figure this orange figure basically shows this orange dots are the residual risk that will remain even after we adapt to climate change and many of the top adaptation measures that farmers are using now will actually become ineffective at higher levels and that's basically all of the lot of the cg work irrigation crop diversification uh, agronomic practices etc just aren't that effective and when it comes to south asia basically like many other parts distortionary subsidies disincentivize climate mitigation and adaptation action. This includes subsidies on, on fertilizer, urea, subsidies on electricity, and all of those actually act as a disincentive to, to act on those climate work. And these include things like, um, uh, and, and some of the action could be all around policy reforms, increase in investments in R&D, uh, reform fertilizer subsidies, reform energy policies, and this is where we at EMI have been working on just energy transitions in agriculture, particularly around grid connected solar farms where distributed solar generation also helps farmers in earning income. Um, and uh, similarly, subsidy reforms may also offer, offer double dividends. So, so these are really win-win ones, or at least we think so, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, less um, less particulate pollution better soil health water quality higher crop yields but i think where the rubber hits the road kind of is really around political resistance and uh, we this region also sees a lot of resistance to subsidy reforms um, so i think we as researchers can uh, help in this in terms of designing win-win solutions experiments but I think we know the problems, we know the solutions, but at the end of the day, these are, these are deeply political uh, decisions. And I think, um, I, I, I think the major constraints really are, are how do we influence those policies in ways that lets us uh, mitigate and adapt. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Back to you.
Thanks, Aditi. You're not the first speaker to point to some of the political economy factors that are at play here in, in coming up with improved policies. So thank you very much for, for that uh, rather daunting presentation on the challenges in, in South Asia. And the fact that aerosols are actually helping to keep temperature down is, I guess, good, but also bad news. Um, that's, that's quite uh, an interesting um, fact. So we're now moving to Sub-Saharan Africa, and we're really pleased to have a colleague from the Alliance with us. Caroline Mungungara is an agriculture and climate change specialist at the, um, uh, at the Alliance of uh, Biodiversity International and SEAT. And she will give us an overview of the challenges and the important role of enhancing greater access to technologies, innovations, and policy solutions in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thanks, Caroline. So thank you. So uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, this chapter on Africa, which was led by Jemima Juki and with three other contributors. Uh, so next slide. Uh, I think this is a very high level summary, but I really want to encourage you to read the chapter, particularly because we know that uh, there's evidence, uh, for instance, in the recent IPCC report that points to the increasing vulnerability of Africa compared to other regions. So what this chapter tries to show is what, uh, at the beginning is how African food systems are evolving and what are some of the determinants of that. And we show how, for instance, uh, there's a rising food import bill, which has driven the gap between production and consumption. And we also highlight some of the key drivers from a climate change perspective that are driving, up, uh, driving uh, the situation for food systems, particularly how we see that there's a rise in hunger as well as a rise in food prices. So we also try to highlight uh, what has been the impact of that, showing that the content, so context in Africa really differs and some regions are more vulnerable, such as the Western and Eastern African regions when it comes to aspects of food and nutrition security. So what we also want to emphasize in this chapter is how can Africa respond, particularly looking at how the food systems in Africa are dependent on rain-fed systems, and this accounts for about 50% of Africa's population. So we really want to point to the urgency for response for Africa. Next slide, please. So one of the risks, uh, previous slide, please. One of the responses that we emphasize is that from a political uh, uh, point of view, Africa is very committed in terms of responding to climate uh, vulnerability and aspect of resilience and adaptation are some of the commitments that have been made by African states. So we look at some of the targets that were put forward uh, about uh, uh, eight years ago by the, through the Malabo Declaration, particularly emphasizing what is the target for climate resilience. And what we realize is that there's really commitment to see that we are enhancing resilience for at least 30% of the households in Africa and looking at how we disseminate and adopt uh, sustainable land water management technologies as well as climate smart agriculture practices. But what we see is that looking at where we are today, only 11 of the 49 countries are on track to meet this commitment by 2025. So that emphasizes that we are really falling short uh, to meet our, our regional commitments that have been set by our leaders in Africa. And one of the things that we really emphasize on this chapter is that uh, the, the, the means to adapt uh, to the food systems in Africa has been driven more by looking at external resources. So the chapter also wants to highlight where is the funding coming from and where are the gaps, and especially looking at the commitment because we evaluated also Africa's uh, uh, national determined uh, contributions for the countries and looked at how those commitments also emphasize that agriculture and the food systems are an entry point for meeting uh, the commitments and the Paris Agreement. Next slide. So one of the graphs that we show is looking at that commitment and looking at how climate finance is provided in Africa. And we particularly uh, look at how does that link to how Africa is responding to its vulnerability? How are we adapting African food systems? And what we see is that a lot of the fund 
which as a, which as I say, the financing is coming from external resources, uh, is going towards mitigation. So 50% of the funds is going towards mitigation, whereas we see that the priority is for us to really emphasize that we need to adapt our system. So the adaptation is one of the goals that we highlight needs to be enhanced. Next slide. So what do we think can be done to adapt uh, African uh, uh, food systems? So one of the uh, messages that we have in this chapter is that we know that there are very many technologies that already exist in Africa, but the gap that uh, remains is that some, most of those are, are largely unproven. And we've given an example of some of the efforts that are in place, including the effort that is led by the African Development Bank uh, to raise uh, resources through the NDC, uh, the Africa NDC hub. And also, also, we also want to emphasize the other several initiatives that are looking at how we can validate and scale climate smart agriculture and climate in, in the information services, uh, like for example, the uh, ICRA project that's led by the Alliance. So what we see is that there's an opportunity for us to scale digital technologies uh, and also to look at how we can contextualize uh, the scaling by looking at the value of research, uh, also how data and information can be pro can be used to provide information for instance, tracking progress as well as emphasizing the use of uh, validating. So what is really the evidence for the use of climate resilient practices in different contexts? And we finalized to say that as much as Africa is really committed on its uh, mitigation commitments, what we see is that there's an opportunity for us to look at the core benefits that can be uh, generated by also focusing on adaptation, which is a priority for Africa. And therefore, we can still achieve uh, core benefits for mitigation, whereas we are also emphasizing that climate change adaptation is what Africa needs to really focus on in order to become uh, resilient. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caroline, for that uh, overview of the challenges and some of the solutions that can be uh, put into place in, in Africa. We're now moving to uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. It's uh, great to have Valeria Pinero with us uh, presenting. She's a senior research coordinator at IFPRI, and she will be speaking about uh, the supporting how to support global food security and sustainability in the region. Thanks, Valeria. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you uh, very much. And thank you all for, for listening uh, today. So um, this chapter, as uh, Charlotte just mentioned, is the Latin America and the Caribbean one for this report. And it was written by uh, also my colleagues, Eugenio Diaz Bonilla and Carolina Navarrete Frias. She's also from the uh, Alliance of um, Biodiversity and CIET. And next slide. So let me start just by giving some context that you mentioned at the very beginning of today's um, event, but just to reinforce it, the fact that the food systems have always and will continue to be exposed to shocks. There are three major disruptors for the agricultural sector, which are weather, pest and disease and conflicts. So they will increase and become more frequent due to climate change and policy responses could mitigate or amplify this risk by reducing uncertainties and created different solution pathways. So when we looked at Latin America and the Caribbean, we have to keep in mind um, that the food systems in Latin America play a vital role in the region's economies, in global food security, and in global response to climate change. So there are two factors that I would like just to highlight here about the region. And the first one is that despite having only about 8% of the world's population, the region recorded more than 30% of global COVID-related deaths uh, until the end of 2021. And then the second one is that also it suffered the worst economic decline among developing countries. So today, the global crisis driven by the pandemic, and more recently also the conflict in Ukraine, is increasing inflation in Latin American countries and causing key agricultural inputs such as fertilizers to become scarce and more expensive, which is affecting today's situation in the region and the world and will also affect next year's supply of cereals and vegetables specifically in particular, but also in other commodities. So the region <clears throat> is very heterogeneous, <clears throat> sorry, 
and there will be differentiated impacts on countries given their structural characteristics, the policies implemented to face the pandemic uh, and also the current crisis, but also by the level of adoption of climate smart agricultural technologies. Uh, next slide, please. So the region has been innovating on a series of climate related aspects, both in regard to science based technology and institution as a means to respond to the barriers to climate smart agriculture adoption and upscaling them. So some examples here are, for example, the climate smart agricultural technologies, that is the most promising one. The technology clusters in the region include intercropping, green manures, cover crops, organic inputs, silvo pasture, conservation agriculture, mulching, improved pastures, stress tolerant crops, and adequate management of grazing, fertilizer, and water use. And then the second one I would like to mention is the biodiversity in agricultural landscapes. The agroecological knowledge must be incorporated into agricultural practices to reduce pests and disease, mitigate climate change, promote crop pollination, and restore soils, landscapes, and ecosystem services. These goals align with the priorities set by the UN uh, post-2020 Global Biodiversity uh, Framework. Last slide, please. So a crisis brings short-term effect, but with long-term repercussions. The region has to think of the right strategy to work on an energy transition agenda and create a more sustainable global food system that will help us better prepare for future crises. So three points to highlight, again, for Latin America. Countries in the region have been experimenting with a scaling up variety of innovation, as I mentioned in the previous slide. The second one is that the private sector could play a bigger role in promoting the adoption of environmental friendly technologies and private public partnerships could help support the availability and financing of these technologies, as well as the monitoring of policy schemes with environmentally, uh, environmental objectives. One example could be through certification and accountability. And then the third one is that Latin America is still suffering from the crisis caused by the pandemic, combined recently with the war in Ukraine, which may affect its key role in both global food security and environmental sustainability. Countries in the region need to develop and effectively implement comprehensive public programs to build back better. So just to conclude, all these will require significant financing and support from international stakeholders, as well as financial and political commitment from the governments in Latin America. The Summit of the Americas that will be held this year could be an opportunity to get this commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valeria, for proposing a strategy to promote both food security and environmental sustainability uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, let me uh, let, let the audience know that there are two additional regional chapters in this year's GFPR. One is on um, South and um, or sorry uh, Southeast Asia, and the other one is on Central Asia. So please take a look at those as well. Um, we're now turning to two distinguished discussants who are both experts in, in climate change. They come from IFRI sister CGIR centers. They will provide some comments on the entire GFPR and also put it in the context of some of the, the global uh, negotiations that are, that are taking place around climate change. It's important to point out, I think Yo did it at the beginning, that both of them are also working with IFPRI in the new CGIR Systems Transformation Science Group. And in that capacity, they are helping to tee up the new CGIR research portfolio, which is coming under the Systems Transformation Science Group. So first to provide some comments is Andy Jarvis. He's the Associate Director General for Research Strategy and Innovation at the Alliance of Bioversity and SIAT. Thanks very much for being with us today, Andy. Thanks a lot, uh, Charlotte, and uh, thanks for, for inviting me in on this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to those of you in Asia. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on this, and, and congratulations, first of all, to, to, to the colleagues that have written these chapters. I mean, I've, I've, I had the benefit of being able to see the, uh, the embargoed version of the, um, of the report um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's been a great read. You know, I think it's a really good uh, state of the art of where we are really on climate and, and food systems. 
So, you know, my take on my, my I'll kind of just elevate up and look between the chapters of what some of the messaging, key messaging is there, right? You know, I mean, the, the bad news is, and this goes beyond this, 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 this book, uh, this report, but, you know, the bad news is that it, I mean, we're in a critical stage of climate, right? Um, I don't know, any of you that, that read news will have seen, for example, this week, um, a new report saying that there's a 50-50 chance that by 2026, we hit the 1.5 degrees of warming across the world. That was a bold um, commitment in Paris just seven years ago. And now in four years, we're facing essentially passing the target that was set then. I mean, we're, we really are in mission critical at this, this point in time. And, and everything that is done now has much bigger impacts in the long term than waiting another 10 years to fix these issues, right? It's about action needs to be taken now. But the good news is, and this is where the report I think is really useful, is solutions are there, and many of these solutions are synergistic. Um, you know, and I think within food and agriculture, for example, we, you know, we, we, a lot of our research over the years has kind of asked this question of trade-offs between adaptation and mitigation. And really, what it's showing is that there's way more synergies than there are trade-offs in these kinds of things. And it's not just within climate action. But it's, it's synergies also with poverty, with income, with food security. We can really fix many of the multiple problems that we have by doing the same things. The, you know, just basically good practice, good policy, good um, technologies, good in, innovations on the ground, adoption of these things can generate multiple synergistic positive impacts, right? And I mean, just some examples across the CGIR that have been very, very successful over the last few years. Alternate wetting and drying in rice reduces emissions, bolsters um, adaptation, uh, maintains or increases income for farmers, reduces water use. It's 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 hitting all the right right um, right um, um, uh, buttons, right? And so we have first of all, you know, I think that's that's a key message coming out from this report that we do have synergies here, but we also have synergies outside of the food and ag sector, and I think you know we're. Uh, IPCC reports and this report has a section on the issue of diets. This wasn't touched on in this in this seminar, but it's in the report. And you know, by working, moving towards healthy diets, we're also synergizing. We're doing climate action, but we're also looking at very important health outcomes. And so, um, you know, we really need to be exploiting these synergies. I mean, it's it, there are no regret scenarios where if we do it, we are going to be better off on multiple points. So that's, you know, the, the way we need to be thinking about these things is really about joined up thinking. Um, joined up thinking, joined up action, joined up doing, and that's at the policy level, the program level, the, the research and development work we do. Um, and, um, you know, I think anyone who's worked in the sector is that things really work when you do uh, link these things up. And it's about linking the research and development with getting the right extension and technical support on the ground, aligning the finance to facilitate the change. In many cases, the right thing is good in the long term, but needs just a little push in the short term. And that's where finance can be brought um, to bear on this. At the policy level, it's about linking up policy, individual, linking up kind of policies to be thinking a little bit more holistically, linking up ministries, environment, health, uh, energy, agriculture, etc. about these kinds of things. Um, and about aligning public policy with also private sector um, uh, more broader kind of policy of private sector and and and, and good business, um, and I think you know if we if we do all of that, basically we get to the point we have to recognize that climate change is transcendental right now, um, and in anything that we do, response to the Ukraine war and the the challenges we have, for example, with inputs and fertilizers, it needs to be taking a climate lens in that re in that reaction in that. Um, um, in the response to that, because there are opportunities in every crisis that we see, there are opportunities to change the business as usual. And that's really what we need to do. And, and, and this report sets out a number of great no regret things that, that can get us there. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks, Andy. I, I think you've really done a nice job of making a case for a food systems transformation approach to looking at climate change and other issues and finding these synergistic uh, solutions. So thank you very much for those for those comments. Our next discussant is Rachel McDonald. Uh, she's the Deputy Director General at the International Water Management Institute. We're really happy to have you uh, also provide your thoughts on, on the report, Rachel. 
Uh, and thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you, Ifri, for inviting uh, Emi in uh, alongside uh, the Alliance. We've been delighted to work with uh, the, the scientists as we put together these initiatives. And it's been it's so exciting to see the collaboration and the new ways of thinking of bringing multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary to the challenge of climate change. Um, as you will, many of you might have seen, the UNFCCC has just um, published its global stock take on adaptation and what is being requested uh, by countries. This is 166 countries, that the latest submissions for their NDCs, and they talk about both mitigation and adaptation. Number one for adaptation, agriculture. 88% of NDCs have agriculture, so food systems has to be there. 86% is water. So it's beginning to say that we have to think beyond uh, and between water, land and food systems as we're tackling climate change. And I've been fascinated to read and try to put together the many different strands of arguments in this report to tease out some of those critical areas. Uh, the balancing of adaptation and mitigation is in there and it demands that landscape scale that, that is advocated in the, in the report. Uh, where we might have good adaptation, it can be poor mitigation or poor mitigation leads to adaptation. And in your report, you talked about uh, having small holders, small farm, uh, small water storages, uh, so ponds or something like that, that can help a farmer adapt to both droughts and floods. But unfortunately, this has, that can have unintended consequences downstream for that. But it can also, if it's managed well, and we can build those synergies that Andy just spoke about, it can also be a great benefit. It can bring biodiversity diversity, enhancement, carbon sequestration, so many of those other things as we're doing. So that's why this interdisciplinary thinking is needed. Another area that comes out loud and clear is about governance. Governance, if we're going to be looking at food systems and we are looking at climate change adaptation of those food systems, and so many of the speakers already today, this is well beyond the farm or the food value chain that those changes are needed to place. Governance plays an important role. And in, in the chapter, particularly chapter seven, that talks about we need local governance, we need national governance. And in the case of some of the natural resources that go into food systems, particularly rivers and river systems, we need international governance. Now, how do we bring that together? It's more, it's difficult enough to look at one key input uh, to managing, say, water or food. But now there is a, this real imperative to link food, land and water systems. As Andy says, this brings in different ministries. It brings in quite different policies, but it also brings in different human and social capital and political economy and uh, power inequities. How are we going to bring those if we are, we need to bring those together for climate adaptation? And I really like the idea of multi-stakeholder platforms a multi-level, multi-centric governance. This absolutely needs to work, but how we're going to do that, we need all our capabilities bringing together for that. And probably the other third area that, that I saw come out very strongly is this notion of nexus. Food systems, energy systems, water systems, and, um, and the environment. We have a superb chapter on rural energy, and we can see how important bringing energy into that thinking. And we can see that play out in the three um, case studies that the country, the regional case studies that's been speak, spoken about. We've had this nexus uh, is, is needed to bring uh, true adaptation to uh, climate change on our food systems. So thank you, Charlotte, it's been great read. I've really enjoyed it. And if we to be congratulated on this terrific report, back to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thanks again to Emi and the Alliance for, for their contributions to this report, as well as some of the external partner uh, authors that also participated in, in, in this research uh, and, and publication. It's now uh, time for Q&A. We've got a lot of questions lined up and we're actually, I, I'm gonna turn to Yo Swinnen for the first question, uh, which is sort of asking two questions at the same time. One, one of our questioners is asking whether the time of producing nutritious food at the lowest possible cost durably is over. Do we need to change the pricing of food? 
And then a perhaps related question to that, Yo, is, is I think the regional presentations focused a lot on the uh, terrible negative impact that climate change is having on agricultural productivity. But of course, we know that food systems also incorporate the entire value chain um, also off farm. So could you maybe just say a few words about how we need to be thinking about value chains in the context of climate change, which is also covered in, in the GFPR in a separate chapter. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you, uh, Charlotte, and thanks for the, for the questions. The, let me start with the, the second one. I mean, the, the food systems is really about the, the, whole, uh, the whole value chain is beyond the value chain, okay? But if you think along the value chain, and we know now that the, the latest estimate put the <clears throat> the share of the off farm part, I mean, from the, between the farm and the consumer, even in lower and middle income countries, at around seventy percent. Okay, so they are a huge part of of this thing. There is relatively good estimates in terms of how they contribute to different uh, parts of the issue in terms of energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. And we have uh, some of that in the report. I think that uh, arguably the, the the most important role that they could play is actually through the institutional organization, or this links a bit with with uh, with Rachel's comment on governance as well. In the sense that I mean, they really link the consumer behavior to the production actions. Okay, and so in a way, the way these organizations are set up in terms of governance, in terms of contracting systems, in terms of standards which are being imposed. On the commodities both in terms of the and, and particularly in terms of the process in this case how the, pr the product is being produced can have a huge impact we know this can have a huge impact because we know it from other uh, areas for example of food safety i mean the standards which are being introduced in europe or in the us trans uh, translate into demands on farmers on behavior at, uh, in developing country and middle income countries and emerging countries. And so the same thing can be done in the area of climate change. I think it's a huge opportunity that is there, but it requires buy-in from all the agent. It requires uh, costing for it, okay, if need be. I mean, I was really pleased to hear what Andy had to say. And they said, well, there, there's uh, everybody talks about trade-offs, but there's actually much more synergies in it than there are about trade-offs. And I think that's a really important message if that can be translated also in this thing. And then to some extent, by bringing this in, you will, the cost of food will be, I mean, the, the real cost of food is there, right? It's just the way the pricing is working. And so integrating that, <clears throat> we have to think of it from a value perspective very, very strongly. Let me leave it at that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Yo. Let me turn to um, to Joe Glauber and ask you three questions related to trade, if I may. The first one comes from Tesfaye Ymir in Ethiopia. How does trade actually help LDCs to cover their food deficit, given that they have limited purchasing power? And shouldn't we put more focus on local production? Another question from Celine Tevenot. Uh, what would international trade look like in the future? Is there a case, again, for having more local food and limiting unnecessary food transport? And then another question, if you don't mind, which is very timely uh, today, what can we do to buffer trade in conflict situations as we're in right now with the war in Ukraine? Can we devise distribution of food production systems more evenly to absorb these kinds of shocks? Yeah, I know these are great questions, and I think particularly given the context uh, of what we see in 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 with the current markets and, and the disruption of global markets due to the war in Ukraine, um, I think I mean certainly there's a role for global uh, for local markets, and but I think that realistically, if we look at the large importing countries, uh, that the trend certainly is they become more dependent on trade. And you have to look, I think you really do need to look at the cost of pursuing more um, self-sufficiency uh, goals or, or, you know, um, um, or, or in some cases, the cost of local foods. I mean, I think that, that um, when you're looking at a global market, there's gonna be some producers that are more cost efficient than others. And I think that that's certainly what we've seen with trade is that uh, trade's been able to facilitate movement of uh, produce and, and production from low cost areas to higher cost areas. 
so I think that the trade will become increasingly important. It's certainly, if you look at import penetration um, trends over the last 20, 30 years, they've increased. And I think that that's not going to decrease. Now, that doesn't mean that one can't improve food production practices, go to more sustainable practices, all that. But I think it, it's, um, you know, I think if nothing else, what the current crisis shows is that I would argue that you need, you know, more flexibility. That is when certain supplies are cut off because of say a war or a drought that uh, countries can turn to other suppliers. That's the beauty of a global food system. I think it's a mistake to think that, well, I can self-insure essentially by producing everything here because if you have a, a bad drought, you will need to go onto the world market. And, and even if you think about doing it all locally, that comes at a pretty high cost. And I think that that also needs to be considered. Thanks, thanks very much, Joe. There's another question on trade, but this one is specific to Africa. So I'm gonna to turn to Caroline for this one. Caroline, what about the role of regional trade in, in Africa? And again, this question is also asking, should there perhaps be more protectionism in Africa to help cushion local farmers? What is, what is your take on that, Caroline? So I think uh, for Africa particularly, we don't see that um, the, the problem that we are seeing that we are addressing now, I think with the African free, uh, free trade area agreement is really to open up actually uh, regional trade because what we see for instance that is contributing to high food loss and wastes is that we are not able to effectively distribute uh, what food is available so i think for africa in particular regional trade is important and opening up opportunities for us to interconnect african countries to respond to demand and to be able to link demand and supply so for me, that's what I see as the important factor for Africa. And infrastructure, of course, plays a great role in supporting that uh, trade between African countries. Thanks very much, Caroline. Um, Aditi, there's a question here um, from the, the, the Dhaka Tribune in Bangladesh. Uh, how, how do you foresee climate vulnerable countries like Bangladesh? What can be done to help farmers to cope with the climate change induced stress situations? I would think um, uh, there are a lot of locally available adaptation that uh, can be done and, and the paper as well as the recent IPCC reports actually cover quite a lot of them. But all said and done, uh, what is very important to understand now that there are certain things that you simply cannot adapt to. We have reached limits of adaptation and the current heat waves that we saw in India are one of those. How do you adapt to heat that a human body or a wheat crop is simply not physiologically fit to endure for a, for a long period of time? So as I say, in many of the contexts, actually mitigation is the best adaptation. So this is really the time to step up mitigation. And obviously countries like Bangladesh have hardly emitted any greenhouse gas. So I think it's really the role of the, of the, of the historical emitters to step up the game, mitigate, because uh, because increasingly for places like Bangladesh, for places like the Himalayas, uh, hard limits to adaptation are being reached very, very quickly. So I would again say that the best action is really mitigation, and that's not where Bangladesh can do much. It's really the historical mitigators that have to absolutely step up their action. And the other is finance. I think without finance, there is it's, it's, it's completely unfair in several ways to ask these countries who have not historically emitted to, to invest in adaptation or mitigation. So I think two action, mitigation by high emitters and finance coming from the developing to the developed countries. I think those are the two uh, two main ways in which I think a country like Bangladesh can cope, plus locally led adaptation, which requires financing. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. I think you make a very important point here that the, you know, some of the developing countries are bearing the brunt of climate change, which has, they have done nothing to contribute to um, historically. Of course, now we see that emissions from developing countries are also rising. Um, but that is a that is a very important point to to keep in mind. 
Um, Dan Gilligan, we have a question here from Amber Peterman directed to you. you. You made, I think, a very important point in your presentation about making climate change responses more inclusive, gender inclusive via social protection. And so people are intrigued by this concept. And what, what does this actually look like in practice? And are there promising pilots or research on, on this topic? Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Amber, for the question. Um, there's actually a lot of evidence that social protection programs, other than being targeted to women generally in terms of social assistance, like cash transfers, um, are often otherwise not that gender sensitive. So there's a lot that could be done to improve the extent to which women are reached and benefit from these programs. Um, and those can include complementary components that help uh, manage women's time use that encourage um, provide support to women uh, who are trying to work outside the home, provide uh, support to encourage others in the household to provide support for childcare practices, for example. We've seen some, uh, IFRI research in several countries has shown that combining nutrition training programs like uh, behavior change communication on nutrition together with cash transfers has led to substantial improvements in women's standing in the household, women's empowerment, and even reductions in intimate partner violence. All of these things, when you combine them uh, with uh, a renewed focus on the way that social protection can improve climate change, um, could actually both improve the standing of women, improve outcomes for women, but also improve then the way that climate change adaptation becomes more, uh, more inclusive. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dan. The last question um, I'm going to direct to, to Rob Voss. A lot of interest in the repurposing uh, work being done. Could you perhaps expand a little bit on your last slide where you talked about, you know, how can we really get around the political economy constraints uh, on this topic? Because, you know, there's that 600 plus billion dollars that could be really spent perhaps in a much wiser way. How do we actually make that happen? Uh, thanks, Charlotte, for that question. Um, yeah, as I, I mentioned, that's always challenging because, well, it's it's one of long-standing policies that has protected the incomes of, of farmers in, in different ways. So taking that away is uh, is particularly uh, difficult and has proven one of the most biggest obstacles. But um, as I uh, mentioned in and what we try to analyze in the report. There's multiple ways that, that have proven that change is possible. Um, one is um, uh, governments that uh, try to push through uh, their commitments to international agreements, be it uh, to the World Trade Organization um, on the trade front and uh, uh, do away with uh, restrictive and, and harmful policies on the trade side uh, or on the environmental side. So also we've seen the European Union countries like China who have been uh, radically shifting their policies in a different direction because of trying to meet their commitments. So um, I think it has to come from a multiple set of, uh, of arguments because a lot of the um, uh, current support provides uh, benefits to say individual farmers and the change we want to make is for social objectives. So what's needed is to align so of the social objectives uh, with the private uh, interest and for what we've seen in the uh, in the repurposing scenarios that we ran there could be this win-win solutions where both farmers tend to gain from investing more more uh, productive technologies provide them incentives or pay them for eco services in order to drive them uh, to different uh, decisions and you could think through those on uh, other dimensions uh, in terms of uh, well targeted uh, demand subsidies in order to make that uh, politically attractive proposition for today's producers and consumers as well as for societies at large and the sustainability of food systems so um, focusing on those elements and leveraging um, interests uh, in those directions uh, can help towards the change that we want thank you very much rob and it's now uh, time to wrap up i would like to thank so much all of the speakers our discussants and of course, the authors of all of these chapters were now moving into some regional and country uh, presentations of the GFPR. So hopefully 
Some of you will have an opportunity to, to join those as well. As I said, a very rich report. Please take a look at it on the IFPRI website. And there are a number of tools that help you get a synopsis of the, the key findings. And I, the last thank you really goes to you, our audience. We've had a number of really great questions. I'm just sorry we couldn't get through all of them. And, um, but we look forward to engaging with you on, on future occasions. Have a great rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. And thank you very much for joining this launch of IFPRI's 2022 Global Food Policy Report.